Hello and welcome to Esri's Fire and Emergency Services webinar series. I am Mike Cox, your Director of Fire and EMS Solutions, and happy today to have with us uh, Pasadena Fire with their presentation of the case study of real-time data integration in support of a multi-agency coordination center. So before we get into it, a couple of housekeeping issues. Uh, please use the chat window in the WebEx box to uh, ask any questions throughout the presentation. We will likely get to them at the end and those we cannot answer. We will uh, follow up with an email either from myself or from um, Oscar from Pasadena. Uh, there will be three interactive poll questions. Please respond to those. We actually use that data to determine you know, use and where we need to, to focus our efforts as far as expanding the use of technology in the fire service and supporting the fire industry. Um, and you may actually notice that some of these questions get repetitive from, from webinar to webinar, and that's on purpose. That's so we can see changes and then how that data is tracking. So there will be a recording uh, posted online after the webinar and an email with pertinent links to, uh, to follow up. So for today's webinar, uh, we have Oscar from the city of Pasadena. And Oscar, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, uh, Chief Cox, thank you. First, I'd like to thank you and uh, Esri for providing me this opportunity to showcase the PFD's integration real-time data supporting the MAC at this year's New Year's Day events. Um, as a state, I'm a captain with the Pas city of Pasadena Fire Department in California. I'm an 18-year veteran. And I've been instrumental in the department becoming an accredited agency approximately five years ago. Currently, I'm on special assignment, reporting directly to the fire chief, and we're ramping up our accreditation process again. As well as I was instrumental in getting our class, our ISO rating from a class three to a class one. Um, my vision, my mission is focusing on in integrating technological solutions that enhance firefighter safety and overall efficiency, as well as empowering all levels of command. Great, thanks, Captain. And uh, for those of you that I haven't met, I am Mike Cox. I'm the uh, Director of Fire and EMS Solutions, retired Deputy Chief from the County of Henrico, Virginia, but essentially I'm your liaison officer for all things Fire GS or EMS GS related. So you'll have my contact information at the end of the webinar, so you can feel free to reach out to me at any point if you have any needs related to, to GIS. So we're going to do a little level set here and make sure we're all on the same page and understanding, you know, what is GIS and the things that the captain's going to present as they deployed for a special event is really beyond just mapping. And that's what most folks think of when they hear GIS. It's a map and it is a map, but it's so much more than that. You know, it's the ability to integrate different data sets and be able to provide the right data to the right people at the, at the right time so they can make good decisions. And that could be for operational issues. That could be for administrative issues, just like captain was describing his accreditation process. All of these functions of the fire service or EMS agencies can benefit from the use of GIS. And we can use GIS to collect data and measure and analyze data because we can't improve something unless we can measure it, right? And being able to understand that data in a visual geo context uh, to, to better collaborate and make better decisions between agencies or within an agency. And it, it, again, it can impact just about any kind of operation related to the fire department and beyond. So not just field data applications that can collect data in real time from the field, but how are we communicating to our elected officials about our performance measures? How are we communicating about the needs of the community? How do we understand what, what population we're serving and where the need is and where the risk is? Do we have a two-way conversation uh, with public information, the citizens uh, from day to day and during disaster response? All these things can be achieved through the use of GIS. And again, not just a map, but it's, it's a, a platform, a communications platform to help you better perform your mission. So with that, a basic understanding of, of what GIS is, I'm gonna turn it over to Oscar and he's gonna describe the impact that GIS had during their special event deployment for uh, the Rose Bowl. Thank you again, Chief. Um, again, Oscar Spolvita, Captain Pasadena Fire, and we're gonna talk about some real-time data integration support of the Multi-Agency Coordination Center. Um, as you know, the Tournament of Roses and the surrounding events, it's a SEER 1 event based on the federal rankings. Um, a little background on the department. Uh, there's an interesting photo here, uh, this left side of the slide. We utilize this for our cover, for our standards of cover, report for our accreditation process. This photo was taken approximately in 1902, and the original building was just on the left side. And we, it expanded to the right side, and it's still standing today, one of the oldest fire stations. But I thought it was unique in the sense of standards of cover. We're looking at historical data and trying to match our performance measures with where we're headed, where we're headed as far as a vision, mission to the department, and how we serve the community. And this looks at the past and goes to the future. For over 131 years, the department served the city 
Um, we cover an area of approximately 23.2 square miles, and we have a daytime population of 142,000 people. We have eight stations and 181 personnel, and in FY18, we responded to approximately 19,482 incidents. But the incidents that I want to talk about to, um, today are from December 30th through January 2nd of this 2018 to 2019. Um, we had within that 24 hour, each 24 hour period, we had about 100 incidents per 24 hour period. And this heat map shows that. Normally we have about 55 calls per 24 hour period. So we had almost 100% um, increase in our call volume. So I'm going to jump right in. I'm sorry, Oscar, I'm going to jump right yeah. into a, to a poll question here. Um, okay. And one thing I'll note while the poll question comes up is, and I should have mentioned it earlier, apologize for that, Cap, but understand that, that Oscar's presenting this in a story map, a GIS-based story map concept or one of our products, so you can see how far along they've come as far as the use of these products. So it's not only is he telling the story to us during this case study, but think about using those for operational briefings or briefing your elected officials. So all the map data that the captain's displaying today in this presentation is live map data. So he can manipulate those maps during the briefing. So it's pretty incredible. So thanks for that, Oscar. The first uh, poll question is, does your agency develop incident maps using GIS during special events? Does your agency use or develop incident maps using GIS during special events. So we're still sending out field observers before the first operational period. And there we go, excellent response there. So 45% of my agency employs GIS to provide dynamic mapping products. That's great. Uh, and, and a good good response from the other two as well. Um, but Oscar's gonna give us an excellent, excellent example of how do we prepare by mapping and providing that incident map to the responders based on the specific transient conditions at a special event. So Oscar, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, sir. Um, going on New Year's Day, the Tournament of Roses, um, the parade itself, there's approximately eight events that happen from the 30th through the 2nd. And highlighting the parade, there's approximately 70,000 tickets that are sold for actually paid seating. And on the parade route, we have a little over 700,000 um, viewers on the five and a half mile parade route. On the same day, we have the Rose Bowl football game, and we have 91,000, almost 92,000 people there. Now, that doesn't include all the tailgaters, especially when you get Texas A&M or some of those big teams coming in with their, say, diesel pushers. You can actually add another five to 7,000 people outside the bowl that are just there to enjoy the um, atmosphere. Post parade is somewhere where the floats are after um, you can view them after the parade for two days, and those have 35,000 per day. And a sip and saver is the precursor to the parade, where um, it's a unique that this year was the first year we had it. It was in, done in conjunction with the actual float viewing of where they uh, develop and uh, finalize the floats. And people could go in, enjoy, mingle with the vendors, and um, basically bring it into more of a family atmosphere instead of just a walkthrough. Worldwide viewership, which is gonna be important, we have 59.3 million viewers in over 200 countries. And social media, which we'll talk about later, um, they average about 171,000 posts on the day of the parade itself. So it's, this is very, it's worldwide, world renowned, and the spotlight is us, and that's why we have that SEER 1 rating. What did, what did we have to do for these eight events? And basically we came up from a uh, small, a medium sized department really into like a metro sized department, but without changing our um, concentration distribution of resources and personnel. So we had to identify our needs and implement solutions addressing accountability, safety, and those that directly support the vision and mission of, of the unified commanders at the MAC. Well, this required collaboration and engagement from over 19 agencies from the federal, uh, state, local, as well as volunteer organizations. And we had to know, show the inherent value of the data elements and how they can impact the strategic and tactical objectives, both positively and negatively for this year one event. As you can see here, again, these are just the calls for the three days. And I've broken it down by our eight fire districts, as well as indicating where our stations are. And right here is where you can see the, in the middle where the highlight, the yellow is, is our greatest concentration of calls um, being 
TV corner, as well as for about four blocks down. From that standpoint, we had to go into what layers identifying and developing the data into usable information was complex. First, we had to take ownership of the data by establishing effective data management systems. My, with our goal, our overall goal was to empower all levels of command, whether that's boots on the ground or it's unified commanders in the MAC or um, potentially the city manager, or if we had to op, um, activate our EOC. So with that, we had to identify what didn't we have. One of them being we didn't have our AVLs for all resources in one map. So we were able to, Esri was gracious enough to provide us with a beta test of their tracker app, which we were able to download onto each apparatus's iPad and we were able to, uh, in real time, capture their locations as well as their logs. And this allowed us to not only provide um, real time location, but we could actually see which units were actually closer and not dependent upon a fire management zone. The other data that we had was street impacts. So street impacts, you might see them all here in pink or this purple color, but they are actually real time. So we had a start date and time for the uh, initial street impact and an end date, meaning that for that segment right here that I've highlighted, it started, the impact started on the 31st at 9 o'clock p.m. and it ended on the 1st at 1 p.m. So at 8.59, anyone viewing these maps in, in the dashboard would not see this highlighted. It would just be a normal street. And then one minute later, it would appear. So that way our resources could see in the field when they're en route to an emergency incident or um, staging at a different location, they could see their best route for ingress or egress. We also had to identify some static layers. Um, we had techno the technology provided an enhanced view of the incident beyond traditional means. For the last, for until this year, all we had were PDFs. We had static maps. They were useful, they were reliable, but they weren't updated. There's all, these maps are dynamic. We needed that real-time um, attribute assets or information for our unified commanders for the situational awareness. So what we developed was, we, in collaboration with our LASO and PD, we were able to grab their zones of coverage, the parade routes, we could see here on the map, these green indicated where uh, emergency services could cross the parade route, as well as for the first time, we're able to identify our helispot locations on our mid-rise and high-rise buildings, not only providing an actual physical address, but also the Latin long, and if there were any weight limits or approach restrictions. That's, that's incredibly well as, important data when they're responding, obviously. Mm -hmm. Keep going, Oscar. I'm sorry. Yep. And so what we have here is also we were able to identify not only a street impact like I showed on the other map that were dynamic, but these are actually focused and in place for the entire duration. So we had TSOs, where traffic control officers, basically barricade. There's barricades there and there's officers there. And you could see that it was at this location, um, Green Street and South Fair Oaks Avenue, and it was in the gold zone for our, our local PD. So everything correlated together, everything was spatially joined. So if we had an incident within one area, we could see which law enforcement um, entity was in charge of that area, um, which area was being covered by what engine, what ambulance, and if needed, um, what special units were available within the area. And with that. So we're gonna go to our next, uh, next poll question. And so essentially, I mean, that was one way, Captain, that you could integrate, if there were any out, out, outside agencies coming to assist, you could kind of integrate their IAP into yours through these visual products. Is that a fair statement? That we could. So we were taking their, their um, event action plans and producing GIS layers from them within ArcGIS Pro or using, utilizing Collector and bringing them into our GIS um, server portal. That's awesome. Very nice. So our next poll question, um, is your agency sharing GIS-based common operating picture 
to outside participating agencies. So mutual aid responses, um, other disciplines within your city or county or state. Uh, is your agency sharing a GIS based common operating picture to outside participating agencies? And the possible responses there are my agency provides paper map products only. My agency uses GIS map products within our agency and does not share them with outside agencies. Or my agency provides GIS maps to participating agencies or mutual aid response or other disciplines. And again, another excellent response, almost half of the departments um, participating provide GIS maps to participating agencies or outside agencies. That's excellent. Captain, turn it back over to you. Thank you. So once again, going over static layers, we also identified into the Rose Bowl here, you, um, some ingress uh, and egress routes for uh, emergency providers. Due to the fact that the bowl is located down in Arroyo and it's very limited access, meaning we have only four ways in, four ways out, basically. We have a little bit more than that, but really because of the street impacts and everything else, we needed to identify clear paths that were, <clears throat> excuse me, that had traffic control um, barricades in place, but that had officers there that could direct EMS resources in and out. Um, because we do have an on-site first aid station, as well as a substation for the PD at the Rose Bowl. So a lot of our EMS um, incidents are handled at the Rose Bowl, and only the most critical are transported to the local receiving emergency room. So we do share, this is the first time we were able to share data with LASO and our PD, as well as the Tournament of Roses, and we're looking to collaborate further and increase our data sharing in the future. And here we were able to identify, this is TV corner. So remember, this is where the 59 point some odd million viewers are lo locating or the, are being, this is where the rose spray is really being recorded, is right here on this corner. And you're looking out this way or you're looking out this way depending upon the telecast that you're looking at. And they start the day after Thanksgiving, produce, uh, erecting all the grandstands and the various assets along the parade route. And we've never had real-time um, imagery of the parade route before this year. And so what we had to base our decisions on were either CAD um, drawings that were turned into PDFs, which done by T-Square and Paper are very complex, um, comprehensive, and they're not really in a usable format for the unified commanders at the MAC. So what we did was, with the assistance of Esri, was utilizing drone to map. And as you can see here, here's TV Corner as it was built out. So this is approximately one day prior to the event. So we're looking at the 30th. And within four minutes, we were able to fly this portion of TV Corner and get a real orth, um, real-time imagery of the build-out. Case in point, um, why, this is, uh, why this is important is because if any of these, prior to this, having this data, all we knew is that there was X amount of people here. We, didn't, we had to take a swag at it, if you want to say, of how many people are here. And actually, on Orange Grove, there is 6,629 seats right here not including the telecast um, booths up above, as well as over here, now you have 11,180. So you can imagine if you had a grandstand collapse in any of these, our incident commanders on the in right there at TV Corner or the unified commanders at the MAC could identify how many potential resources they're gonna need, ALS, BLS, transport, versus in the past, it was merely a swag. This information is critical in acquiring up-to-date data in the past, which was labor-intensive with the majority of the data not providing exact rep representations of the incident. And again, the UC is needed exacting counts and locations. And with this, they were able, again, we flew it for four minutes and we provided the, this ortho mosaic and we were able to put it on AGOL, RTS Online. The next one we were able to do, again, I talked about the sip and saver. So we had about, what was that, about 20,000 people per day. And right here is where they actually develop um, some of the uh, floats themselves, and they finalize the building, and they put the um, 
the flowers on and I do do the final prep. There's a catwalk there and people can walk along the cat pay to walk along the catwalk and see how their the final preparation is done. But this year what they did was they've gone ahead and this is a sip and savor. So they can see that they've taken over Jackie Robinson Park or baseball field. And this is used by our local city college, Pasadena City College. And they were able to put this underlayment and then build out this entire infrastructure, which we've never had before. And again, all we had were the CAD, the permits, which were CAD drawings, and really not in a useful, um, a user-friendly format. And so again, we flew this the same day, the day before, for about four minutes, um, with the assistance of Pasadena PD. They were on site, their airship unit had a representative there. And we were able to actually fly this and then provide um, real great detail. We can zoom in down to the actual person or down to the actual layer. And the other thing is that we were able to utilize Collector for this. So Collector was huge in trying to identify each of these points. So when an incident came in, instead of saying that the chest pain was near the hot dog cart, and there were actually multiple hot dog stations around here, we could actually show the incident location and identify a physical feature within this uh, sip and saver event, and our resources could be deployed effectively and efficiently. So again, it's a matter of these two maps coming together using drone, drone to map, ArcGIS Online, ArcGIS Pro, and bringing everything together and providing our empowering all levels of command with information that is both useful and efficient and it makes everyone efficient and effective. Um, and we could actually see resource deployment changes based on the information that we're gathering through this drone to map as well as through collector. That's great. So it's, a basic, it's, part, of, it's part of your size up essentially. I mean, you know, what it helps, you do, it helps you determine Correct. deployment and what resources are needed. Correct. Because you can see here, Chief, that in the past, all we had was this blank layout. How is How does that help resources, boots on the ground, or the incident commanders, or the right. UC, or, right. or anyone in EMS, really? Yep. It doesn't. Excellent. It's Excellent. not until you get into it. And we actually so have a question that, from the audience related to, to UAS operations, and it's, it's about... Um, uh, our agency has had mixed results using drone to map during wildfires. Did you have any experience, any issues, any challenges, and how did you overcome them? Did you have any issues at all putting together these incident maps using a UAS? Um, we personally, the fire department doesn't have a UAS program. Let me start start off with that. So we utilize the assistance of our the Pasadena Police Department, their aerial ops division, as well as Esri to come in and assist us with developing um, these maps and these ortho mosaics. Um, it was relatively easy, the process was straightforward, and the result was 10 times what I expected, 100 times what I expected. I never expected the detail that I saw with the minimal amount of flight time. I would have thought that this area right here would have taken about 30 minutes to cover to get this granular of a detail. Excellent, thank you, Cam. You're welcome. So moving on, the, this is the role. Again, in the past we've had, we utilize the Brookside Golf Course, which has a north and a south end, and we park hundreds of, tens of thousands of vehicles out here. And as you can see, there are landmarks out there, but we don't keep them, we don't, we've never identified them before. And we've kept them into really large polygons. So this would be, let's just for say instance, this whole area would be lot A and you would have an incident there, whatever it may be, and they'd say it's in lot A. Well, you'd have to try to find that vehicle or see if someone's flagging you down, and either our foot teams or our rescue carts or an R, a rescue ambulance coming along the side would have to try to identify where that location is and then try to get resources in. Through the assistance of the Rose Bowl itself, we are able to grab their CAD drawings. So actually their computer-aided drawings, and within ArcGIS Pro and the assistance of our GIS team here at, um, within the city, we were able to grab those CAD renderings and geoprocess them within ArcGIS Pro and overlay these onto our imagery. 
again, what this, what this does is, just like it did for TV Corner, it provides a granular view that we can drill down to, to go from that 36,000 foot view all the way down to a foot. So we can zoom in here if we wanted to and see exactly down to the feet. And we could actually run some scenarios as far as um, what, if an event happened here, what is the best ingress or egress? Is how many people are located within this section? How many resources are going to we need? What is impacted? Where are the actual hydrants? Where is the built out infrastructure? So this was huge. Again, a, this collaboration of data, it was, it was never seen before within our maps as far as the tremendous amount of detail and the ability to dr drill down to the individual seat. And like I stated, the golf course parking indicated exact locations, not generalized zones. And the, the CAD rendered maps were in, just huge for our boots on the ground and for our um, unified commanders. Moving on, so how do we put this all together? Because obviously we're not going to utilize all these different layers singularly. We had to put it into a user format, something that was usable and what they needed. And so this is the actual uh, chief officer's, the chief officer's dashboard that we built out. Now again, it's got the data from the, from the 30th through the 2nd on here. What we did was we started off with, okay, what do they want to see? What do they need to see? We didn't want to give it too much complexity. We wanted to keep it real-time data utilizing a pulse point API because we had never had our CAD um, information in real time. And so pulse point was able to give us a connection to their API, which is free. And we were able to develop it into a feature service and we could see it here in real time. So what we had was we had our active calls and then we had the last 24 hours. What this does is if we had a listing here of the active calls and units could be able to click on an incident. It would zoom in, pop, flash it, as well as give you some information on it. So it was an altered level of consciousness. Agent 33, RA 33 responded. Here's the address, 1550 Mar Vista, location cross streets, lat long, um, and some generalized uh, response time analytics, as well as just some CAD response time information. And this was provided for each and every incident that we had that was active. We didn't do that for the last 24 hours because it was just really to see where our concentration of calls were and what were the types. Again, we have, we're accredited department and we're going through the, getting ramping up for the accreditation process again. So obviously, the chief command staff, well, they want to see their response time analytics. And so we were able to provide that in a quick snapshot of utilizing the last 24 hours as well as active calls. So you can see our alarm handling was 6.69 seconds and our benchmark is 60. So everything in white was the actual and the benchmarks were in this orange color underneath. And then we broke it down from there. So basically, like this TC, the alarm handling was 19 seconds and for our PSAP, and our alarm handling was 35. Turnout times, we did the same thing, but now you can see where we included for the commanders our, be our benchmarks. So a minute for everything that's not a structure fire or wildland related, because we have to put on that PPE. So anything within that, so if you looked at this one right here, it's an alarm. So they should be within a minute, and we didn't, it's a minute 31. And we get a lot of fire alarms. And we did the same thing for all of our travel times, our total response times. So that's from the initial PSAP receiving the call to the time that we are on scene. And then our response time. So that's the time that our units receive the call to the time that they're on scene. And then we also did unit utilization based on type code. So you can see that a heart, um, a chest pain call, was almost uh, an hour and 45 minutes. So this is the crucial information for our command staff to know about because they need to know why were they, why was a unit on scene for nearly, or not on scene, but associated with this call for an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes. What caused them to be extended on this incident when our average turnaround time is about an hour because we have a hospital here within the city. As well as you can see, we can we went by count of call types. So fifth, our alarms, which are always number one, 
we had 15 TCs, we had five. And then also we, I wanted to include our actual locations. So this is all information we, we were able to pull from that Pulse Point API connection. And we were able to see that Pasadena Care Center, which is a skilled nursing facility, we had two calls and everything else was pretty much status quo, just one call per each. But I wanted to give them the top 20. And it really just helped us better understand where the calls were located as far as concentration. And if, the, if these skilled nursing facilities had, let's say, 10 calls, why were there so many calls there? Were they understaffed or was there something else going on? And then on the right side, since the Verdugo, we get dispatched by the Verdugo Fire Communications Center, and it's owned um, conjointly by Burbank, Fire, Burbank, Glendale, and Pasadena. And we dispatch for 14 fire departments within the area, as well as um, our area C, as well as extended. And the chiefs wanted to see unit status. They wanted to see system status. So right here, you can see that Glendale's, what units are being assigned. And again, this is just a, utilizing that pulse point API that, that is free. We're able to capture it and use it in real time. So Oscar, a couple questions about that about that dashboard. Um, what was the source of your unit GPS data? I know you discussed using the tracker application, but was there any other sources of AVL, your day-to-day -day use? So our day-to-day -day use, we're unable we're unable to capture through our CAD real-time AVL use um, or locations for our units. It's a rather a lengthy pro process to capture that and we were unable to use that real time. So track Esri came in and said, hey, there's this, maybe we can get this tracker app and beta test it with you. And that's what we were able to utilize for not only our units and our, our, our emergency resources for the fire department, but we were actually able to put it on, as well as Turner Rose's floats, band leaders, and some of the tow trucks. So we could see the progression of the parade down the route. Well, versus great. just trying to take a swag at it. Um, so this is the first time we're able to actually capture that information because the units on their mobile data computers in each apparatus, they can click on the map, the CAD map, and it will only show, reference their location. It won't reference any other uh, apparatus locations. So you can see like right here, we have two resources, Engine 33, and we have a RA33 right there. So you can imagine if they're coming in code three to that intersection, it's crucial information to see where they're at and who's coming to the intersection because sometimes we have blind intersections, meaning um, we have, because of the building layout or the size of structures or other objects that impede the vision um, coming around the corner. And so sticking with this um, dashboard view for just a moment, did you utilize the US National Grid or any kind of gridding system, say in the parking areas or um, any of those? Uh, special event incident areas? So right now we just went ahead and kept our zones the way that they we had prior to. So going back to our static layers, we had resources deployed already. We had staging locations for our first aid stations as well as our units themselves. So you could see like right here, we had RA-791, which is a automatic aid resource. And they have a, a generalized staging location and the start time that they're supposed to be there. And we have the unified commanders know that they have a zone of coverage. And basically, it's anything west and south of the boulevard. Because otherwise, they would be try impeding the flow of the, of the parade, right. which we can't have. No, no, of course not. And so last question about, about this particular dashboard. The question is, who developed the dashboard? Who put it together? Again, it was uh, a collaboration between myself, it was Esri coming in and helping with these little widgets that are here um, for some of the analytics. And, but the most, most importantly, it was just a basic understanding, for me it was a basic understanding of what was needed and it wasn't high level programming that was required. It was just some fundamental knowledge that I captured on the Esri website through some white papers, um, through some uh, best case uh, scenario, use scenarios. And that really has, uh, supplemented my level of knowledge because really it wasn't until about five years ago that I knew about Esri um, during our last accreditation process. And up until this time, I've slowly but surely, you know, been self-taught as well as, a, um, 
look for the assistance of ESRI through their uh, public safety ent um, entities within the program itself, like yourself, Chief. Well, and, and to your point, you know, there's there's no coding involved in these products. You know, it's in it's in that cloud-based environment, in the geo cloud, web-based. You know, no desktop software, pretty much drag and drop. And like you said, the important part of it is what are your needs and what is the data you need to make decisions. So, thanks, Ex excellent response. Exactly. And you know, we had to make sure that, like I said before, that this user interface or UI was formatted for the target audience. And we wanted to ensure that for the chiefs, as this chief operations, they wanted current as well as historical incident data, some response time analytics, and the ability really to drill down the actual incident data and see what resources were being deployed to those areas. Again, moving on, here's another dashboard that we had. So on the first, um, we utilized a weather dashboard. We actually had within the Mac a NOAA representative on site, and he was um, a wealth of knowledge for us because, um, as some of you may know or may not know, wind was a major factor up until the start of the parade. So what we did was we had some sustained speed. Um, we have set some thresholds. Sustained speed greater than 10 miles per hour, gusts greater than 30, and that information would would occur here or show up here, as well as some lightning strikes and wind conditions. And this is all real time, utilizing some feeds that we had. And again, it was merely, these are just merely um, mirror images of either a layer that's already on ArcGIS Online, it's on um, the internet, and it's just a hyperlink. You just copy the, the web address and you bring it in, and you just size it to what you need. A lot of this is just plug and play. It's user friendly, setting up these dashboards. And I found the hardest part is trying to limit the amount of information um, that I could put into these dashboards. Because I found myself trying to stuff, you know, 200 fish into a barrel. And it wasn't any useful um, format. There was too much information. And we had to really refine it and define what they needed. And the ability for this one was real-time weather data, ability to set the thresholds like I stated before, and which allowed the fire chief who was monitoring the wind thresholds um, because he, there was possibly a delay or cancellation of, of the parade, which there wasn't. And it wasn't up until you know about 10 minutes prior to that he was able to finally decide, hey, this is a go, because a lot of these floats have pyrotechnics as well as the opening uh, show of the parade itself, the opening couple minutes. And so, you know, wind and the gusts, wind was really a major factor in this. Moving on, social media. So again, remember I said that the Rose Parade averaged approximately 171,000 social media posts. Now, what does that mean? Okay, how do we turn that into a useful information instead of just a good to know? So what we did was we were able to um, build these widgets on the side. Again, these are just counts. And what they are is each of these has a defined query behind it. So we were able to define a query for terrorism events, active shooters, evacuation events, power outages, gas leaks, and bomb threats. Each of these had certain criteria. And if it was met, then you would see a number would pop up. I was hoping that would it's live right now that we would actually see one pop up and we can go to it. And the use, what's useful about this is you see at the Mac can see the location of the post, who posted it, and see the actual post in the social media platform. And this is all public facing information. We're not, it's not behind the scenes or like that. This is all public facing. So everybody that has their settings and social media of the public, that's what we're querying. And these definite, these queries of, these widgets over here are continually reading that information and trying to see if something fits those parameters. So let me zoom out and I thought maybe we could get one. So like a gas leak right here. So there is one and you can see that it comes up, they would click on it. Here's American gas leak tracker, um, the region, uh, the date and time. It's a gas leak, Latin long. And if you wanted to, you could actually go to the social media post and drill down even more if you wanted to. So this was useful. 
the biggest, another big one dashboards we built out was our traffic dashboard. Remember I stated like in this purple right here where our street impacts, what we did to the street for the 30th through the 2nd. And these, these we have set up to show you exactly where they're at. Um, but they, again, these were set on real time, so start and end time. And over here, you can see where the post parade is. So again, this is where that 35,000 people per day. We have another 97,000 over here for the Rose Bowl, plus the 700,000 that are along the parade route. And everyone's coming in the morning of, at least at two, three in the morning. Um, the Bowl is getting their Class A diesel pushers in there sometimes the night before. And post parade is ongoing for the following two days. But we needed to monitor the routes in and out not only the streets we also had to find out the freeways and the rail system i mean this is vital information when you have a city that's normally 142,000 people and you increase it to nearly 900,000 in a small dense location and that then you add in all these emergency incidents our number one goal for the these events is to ensure that if Mrs. If Grandma calls 911 on the day of the event, that she receives the exact same level of service and response time that she would any other day of the year. And we need to see this real-time data in order to accomplish that for her. And whether that's our, our, our tracker, utilizing the tracker for our units, or real-time incident locations for the entire city. The other one, remember I talked about user interface. Remember, use of real-time data is dependent upon the end user's overall experience. That's number one. And the fire service, firefighters, if it doesn't work the first time, we're not gonna use it again, or we'll be very hesitant to use it again. We move on. And so we, I had to ensure that the end user's overall experience was a positive one. We identified a need to develop views based upon the user's platform. Again, these views, these dashboards, these web maps, they are they can be they were built on a single platform, but they can go from any desktop, any tablet, any smartphone, as well as you can print out static maps from these. Obviously, you won't have the interaction with it, but those that's the level of sophistication or the development on the backside that it has really done and ensuring that we don't have to develop each and every possible use case scenario. And it's just, again, user friendly and with it, it just made my life a whole lot easier. So this is the one that we built for the iPad and obviously it's in the dashboard, but all we need, all the units needed to see in the field was active calls, last 24, their locations again, incident locations, right? Inf incident information, as well as where are those other resources, right? And where are they traveling to or are they static? That end time, that end, um, the user platform was crucial. It was monumental that we had that built out because there's no way that they would have been able to handle all the an analytics and the various system sit stat on the right side of the fire chief's dashboard and trying to view it on a smartphone, let alone an iPad in the field. So as these tools allow for a seamless experience across a multitude of platforms without having to develop each one independently. And it was very beneficial to me to have this. So when you're when you're distributing or when you're pushing out this, this instant intelligence in these maps, you're using various devices, right? So it could be an iOS pa uh, um, tablet, it could be a, a Android telephone, it could be a smartphone rather, or it could be a, an MDC like a Windows 10 device, is that correct? Correct. And as well as a desktop, which we had in the Mac, because we had multiple viewing monitors um, that could be, uh, that were utilized in the the center. So as far as mobile units, I mean, was it, was it down to the tactical level? Were they getting this real-time data and mapping or, or down to division group soup or where or was anybody? They had, anyone across the department that had access, everyone in the department had access to this information and it was based upon their need and what they def what they were um, most familiar with so we still provided those static pdfs um, but we also they already had access to these dashboards as well awesome that's great so i think we're up to our third and final poll question 
So is and much uh, as we we're just discussing about tablets and smartphones, um, is your agency deploying mobile applications in the field to collect incident data or track personnel? Is your agency deploying mobile applications in the field to collect incident data or track personnel? And the answers are we are not currently performing mobile data app collection. We collect incident data and manually upload information products or we use mobile GIS apps like the captain's describing to track our personnel in real time. So we'll give them just a moment there. And I, I will make a, make a note that we have um, several of our uh, field applications provide that tracking ca uh, capability, including workforce. So you can you know, have real time tracking. And actually, I don't know if you had a chance to, to leverage it at all, Captain, but you know, they, they'll develop what we call a breadcrumb trail. So you've got a historical view mm -hmm. of where all your, all your personnel down to that walking team or individual device level, you know, where they were throughout the operational period. So it's pretty mm -hmm. impressive. Pretty impressive distribution, you know, for a major event. You think about an earthquake or, or somewhere where you're doing damage assessment, you can actually see where the where the um, those tactical level units have been and, and you know where they haven't. So if you're planning resource deployment, yep, you know, it's it's pretty incredible, yep. pretty, pretty useful application. Oh yeah, you're 100 percent correct. And we have in the chief officer um, dashboard that layer was there. It was just turned off um, oh, due to the fact the amount of data the amount of data that was there. Um, but we really didn't um, utilize it to its fullest uh, effect or, you know, how it could be. We need to increase that um, functionality and find how it, how it can integrate with us. Great. Um, and, then, you know, we were talking about the, 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 the dashboards and that, that whole concept. Um, we will have, along with some of Oscar, Oscar's information at the end of the, uh, end of the slide, so a link to that um, off-the-shelf template that you can use to develop those dashboards pretty easily. Okay, so is your agency deploying mobile applications in the field to collect incident data? Um, again, pretty good. We are using mobile GIS in real time, 40%, so almost half. That's great. Um, so we'll turn it back over to Oscar, and you can you can wrap it up on your side. Yeah, uh, thank you again. Um, you know, thank you, first off, for this entire process, for giving us this chance to sh showcase what we did. And it was, if not for the the collaboration engagement from all the agencies, um, we wouldn't have been able to empower all levels of command. These new new tools that we developed, um, that we utilized, increased everyone's situational awareness and provided real-time insights with each event. And those tools, like it's showing here, which I'm utilizing for my presentation, which is the story maps, but also drone to map, which provided that real-time um, or uh, imagery, as well as collector for locating points or identifying points on a map, operations dashboard, which were all the dashboards that we utilized, and survey one, two, three for those uh, taking our electronic, our paper forms, turning them to electronic forms and capturing data that way, as well as ArcGIS's open data. That was um, crucial in trying to find uh, different layers. Again, it was trying to identify our need, find a tool that would best um, benefit and provide the result we needed. And as always, there are lessons to be learned and identification of next steps. And we're already in the process of looking at that and how we can always improve upon it. And having the buy-in from not only command staff, but from uh, the city as well as our partners within law enforcement and the tournament um, was crucial. And again, we just thank Thank everybody for um, collaborating and making this a worthwhile endeavor. Um, again, I thank you, Chief and Esri, for providing us an uh, opportunity to showcase the real-time data integration. No, Cap. No, I appreciate the way the deployment was incredible, and we, you know, we see continued evolution and the ability to manage special events and no-notice events, you know, like a, a hurricane, earthquake, tornado. Um, but the, you know, the, again, the important part is that ability to to share data. Um, I mean, we're still doing hand-drawn maps in that initial attack, right? We're not going to a house fire and, and walking up to the front door with a tablet in our hand, but yeah. for, these, for these expanding incidents, we have to have the ability to develop this incident intelligence and, uh, and, and provide that to our responders, you know, so they can make, make good decisions. Um, so exactly. you, can, you can see um, my slide there on the screen. There we go. So um, as we as we wrap it up here, and we'll get to a couple of questions. So we've got several questions, Oscar. We're not going to be able to get to all of them, but um, we'll we'll cover yeah. a few, and ho hopefully you've answered a majority of them um, as you went through the went through the uh, presentation. Um, but a call to action to the, to the folks in the webinar, you know, understanding that the majority of the fire departments 
that are that are on this on this call already have access to this capability. So if you're not engaging it at all, certainly reach out to me or or, or, or even even Oscar, the captain can help you. You know, talk you through how to engage um, if it's an outside agency like a city or county IT department or at the state level. Uh, but you know, it's it's owned by most state and local governments, so you have access to it. So if you're not engaging, you know, please reach out and let us help you um, engage that. And, and, you know, find out what, you know, what is your need? Find some low-hanging fruit, whether it's, you know, day-to-day -day operations or special events, or maybe we just want to do one of those chief dashboards and bring our bring our CAD data, our records management data into it, be able to do performance measures day-to-day. -day. Um, quick note, we have a couple of uh, couple of events coming up. Our um, our National Security and Public Safety Summit, the ESRI UC, is July 6th through 9th. And that's a that's a event specifically for public safety. It's followed by our users conference, which is nearly 20,000 people on the San Diego uh, waterfront there. But the first three days of that are focused, and it's it's you know 500 to 1,000 people, and they're all firefighters, police officers, emergency managers. It's an incredible event, and Oscar, I, I believe you've spoken there before. You certainly attended. Um, mm -hmm. But well worth the trip. You know, if you can come spend a few days with us, and, and again see focused solutions just for public safety. And so some links here, and these, you know, if, if you don't do a screen capture now, these will be in the email we send out as a follow-up. Um, the last three there are um, the special events that that has a lot of the solutions that Oscar described as, as they were dealing with the Rose Bowl and the Rose Parade. Um, and then our, our overall uh, public safety solutions fire and EMS page so that has templates, and those templates are about 80% configured. You just kind of add your data. You can download them and start using them today and just add your data to it and have an impactful uh, impact on your operations. And then the last one is that that chief's dashboard, that fire incident dashboard that uh, Oscar's is, you know, a whole lot prettier than ours is as far as the off the shelf, but it's very, very configurable. <laughs> so, you know, you can you can start adding your data and it's very flexible and you, know, you can filter the data as, as the captain was showing the way you want it. You know, what data do you need to get to your decision makers? And that's an excellent product to, to be able to do that. And so, Cap, I got a couple questions here. Let me see if I can find them. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm trying to get to that page. So is the GIS data Nina or, or not next gen 911 compliant? And did you have any issues configuring the data with apps using a Nina model, or did you even try? No, we didn't have any, um, to my knowledge, because it's directly Pulse Point is receiving a direct feed from our CAD, which is next gen next gen capable, and we're actually in the process of updating our CAD as well. So we had no issues with it. We're basically viewing um, what was in the CAD and just in a, you know, a user interface that was compatible with what we needed. And so that leads us kind of to the next question there. The pulse point, you already had pulse point in your city. So you'd already had that set up. Correct. So again, I like I was staying in the Verdugo Fire Communications Center um, is the is the lead agency or um, joint where the Three cities own it, but we dispatch with 14. So all those departments are part of Pulse Point. And so we were able to utilize that association and bring it over to the city level and grab onto their API and develop a uh, feature service that we could utilize within our maps. And did you, did you, were you able to use that story map concept for any operational briefing or maybe briefing of, of command staff or elected officials? Uh, not yet. <laughs> okay. Um, it, we, we have, we have, uh, showcases to public, our public safety committee, and they were very, um, they were like, it, it, the PowerPoint did, could not do justice for the amount of, the level of detail or the uh, interactive, um, features that were available via the story map. So they made note of that. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So that's, um, I think we answered most of the questions. We'll have a few that we'll have to uh, to follow up with an email just to make sure that we've got the right sources of some of this data and outside agencies. But, um, Cap, I certainly appreciate it. Excellent, excellent, excellent presentation. Um, you know, enjoyed having you there, and, and hopefully we can we oh. can do the, the same thing again, you know, for any of your, your upcoming special events. And, uh, again, to yeah, the audience. Thank you, know, you. Yeah, absolutely. Again, to the audience, you know, find out what you have access to, find out what your needs are, and certainly reach out. Uh, if you need assistance. So from Esri and, and from Pasadena Fire, I hope I can speak for you, Captain. Thanks so much for the attendance and see you at the next mm -hmm. one. Goodbye.